going on. Okay. So yes, we can see that. All right. So the quotation in the title of this paper um, is from the Welsh Anglo poet David Jones's autobiographical talk in October uh, 1954. And he says, the artist, no matter what sort or what the medium, must be moved by the nature of whatever art they practice. Otherwise, they cannot move us by the images they wish to call up, discover, show forth, and represent under the appearance of this or that material through the workings of this or that art. This statement, here generalized to all forms of art, reminds the recipient of that art that the most powerful impact derives from connection, so connection at an emotional level. The intellectual or aesthetic follows. That jolt of recognition that engages the listener viewer creates of them a participant in the art. This phenomenological perspective of art extends to all the forms in which David Jones himself sought to communicate, engraving, watercolors, oils, sculpture, poetry, essays. It is critical to be moved in order to move. And this largely echoes the function of medieval art and medieval religious writings, that is to affect or affect, to be effective. So there's a kind of first connection. So this evening, I'm, I'm gonna revisit David Jones to look again at some of the medieval connections in his work. And they help us explicate what he might have been seeking to achieve if there is that conscious a movement in his oeuvre. His poetry and inscriptions have been explained as hybrid, as renewal, as bricolage, um, but I don't read him in that way, as we'll see. Further, I'll briefly discuss a handful of other of poems by others, Ruth Bidgood, T.H. Parry Williams, a uh, former student and fellow of Jesus College, Beatrice Spooner Jones Levitoff, um, whose meditative devotional focus I see as being in the Jonesian vein. Uh, so that's all of those, in distinction to others from, say, Dylan Thomas to Gillian Clark. This kind of overarching interpretation leaves plenty of room for criticism, um, but this paper it represents a start in my research and I'm truly grateful for any feedback. So I have been working on David Jones for more, <laughs> more than a decade. I don't think you'll believe it by the end of the paper, but it's true. Um, I, you know, I have other things to do all the time, whereas in fact you need all the time um, to work with these, with these poets. Anyway, a little context will provide a framework too. Um, I designed and taught a course at Stanford at both undergraduate and graduate levels called Living on the Edge, Literatures and Landscapes of the Western Fringes. And it was partly designed to um, um, help me with homesickness, really, I think. I don't know if that's a motivation, but it certainly impelled me forward. So I, imagine, I imagined that having been born on the Western Edge, Aberystwyth, and now finding myself living in California on another, that there might be something common in the expressiveness of Western poets, um, particularly native poets, living through or inheriting a legacy of colonization, very different forms of colonization, but still the oppression of cultures and languages. And in this course, we explored David Ap Gwilym, Dylan Thomas, R.S. Thomas, Ruth Bidgood, David Jones, Walder Williams, T.H. Parry Williams, Gwyneth Lewis, Sharon Morris, and then on the Californian side, Wendy Rose, Laylee Long Soldier, Tracy K. Smith, Linda Noel, Juan Philippe Perara, and Beth Piotot. From depictions of landscape in these poets' work, we sought some connective thread. And actually, in the end, I don't know that there is one. But what did emerge for me is the sense of the medieval and the ancient in some of our Welsh poets and the evocation of ancestral community in our Native American and Latinx poets. Perhaps those equate to shared understandings of belonging, even through dislocation or distance. Now, an engaged relationship with the landscape is revealed by David Jones in Epoch and Artist. He says, it was at this propitious time uh, that circumstances occasioned my living in Nantondi, so 1924 to 1926, there to feel the impact of the strong hill rhythms and the bright counter rhythms of the Avonid, Dravoid, the Waterbrooks, which make of Wales such a plurilel. Um, meaning lovely, loveliest, and of course, um, influenced by Joyce there. Um, there was this amazing exhibition at Agair in Brecon. I don't know who saw it of David Jones' materials, many of them in private hands. So um, that's really fresh in my memory. 
The influence of the medieval and, of course, others' modernist writings on David Jones and his circle of artists, artisans, is quite well known. In recent years, books by Ro uh, Paul Robichaud, uh, Making the Past Present, David Jones, The Middle Ages and Modernism, and Francesca Brooks, uh, Poet of the Medieval Modern, have revealed the significant impact of medieval thought, medieval manuscript cultures, and medieval literatures across languages on Jones's extensive corpus. My own interest in David Jones emerged partly from the medieval and multi multilingual aspects of his work, but initially actually arose from my research into Edward Johnston and his calligraphy and Eric Gill and his um, uh, various artworks, um, which I was working on for this monograph that Ellen mentioned, Beauty in the Book. Um, it may see the light of day at some point, uh, or perhaps a long article or something, we'll see. So Jones's poetry and essays, his inscriptions and watercolours are a kaleidoscopic exposition of a hyper-politicised um, Western culture told through a westward gaze that lingers on millennia of pre- and post-historic human endeavours and achievements. His literary and visual landscapes permit dynamic reflection on early medieval borders and in-between spaces in ways that are eye-opening and transformational, demonstrating that the pre-existing cannot be erased that the past is labyrinthine, and that for Jones, as indeed for us in this contemporary place and time, it's the aperception of what Augustine called, a phrase that I use in almost every paper I give, simultaneity of eternity. So for Augustine, the simultaneity of eternity is what in effect reveals all. For David Jones, the originary myth of Britain is distilled and placed within the framework of the salvific Christian mass and presented in his novel-length poetic masterpiece, Anathemata, Fragments of an Attempted Writing, published by Faber and Faber in 1952, and encompassing seven seconds of actual time. Uh, described in 1953 by Desmond Shute as, and I quote, an epic coterminous with recorded and unrecorded time. And by Thomas Dilworth, Jones's most recent scholarly biographer as, and I quote, an anatomy of Western culture. Anathemata seeks to mediate the complexity of multilingual, multicultural, British and European pasts, making reference to sources as rich and diverse as the Bible, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, Guthlac, Mabinogion, The Dream of the Rood, Virgil, Mallory, Chaucer, Augustine and Dunbar. This dense, elusive network of sign making creates a scenic backdrop for a mass of humanity. Of great importance to David Jones's place, land and sea, and the journeying from one place to another, especially in terms of crossings of boundaries. In the section Angle Land, Jones conveys the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons. Past where they placed their Ingas names, where they speed the Coulter deep in the open Engle fields to this day. How many poles of their broad Angle hidage to the small scattered plots, to the lightly furrowed Erwild, that once did quilt Boudicca's royal gwelly. This account of the replacement of place names and of land division and bequest from Celtic acres, Erwai, to Anglo-Saxon pole and hide, reveals Jones's deep historical knowledge and consciousness of cultural displacement. In a country like Wales, where its people have struggled to maintain their voice, their language, their identity, naming becomes all important. And as W.H. Auden commented in his review of Anathemata, and I quote, in Mr. Jones's poetic universe, proper nouns, brackets, all foreign words partake of the nature of proper nouns, calendars and atlases are the most conspicuous features. Jones's poetry then is located. These atlases and directional points denote geographical, historical and topographical precision. Such mapping is augmented by the abundance of notes that Jones provides to assist the reader in determining not just the meaning of the complex references within the poem, but also the pronunciation of Welsh, German, Old English or Latin words, phonemically <laughs> spelled out so that the poem is sounded properly. Place, time, space, and that is actual space on the page, and sound evoke Jones's world. D.S. Carn Ross calls this kind of spacing, um, which is from um, Sleeping Lord and Other Fragments, and this is the uh, fatigue, he calls this cut verse um, in his article on Jones's life in 1974. And David Blamires reflects on the antiphonal function created by the spacing um, mm. at times in the poem. So the call and the answer of the priest and the people in the liturgy. It's also reminiscent of um, Old English verse, but sort of, you know, 
stepped Old English first. There's a, it's not a sejura, or is it, in many of the half, well, they're not half lines, or are they? Um, and obviously very deliberate. Space is really interesting. So in this and this, both from the same poem, Images from the Fatigue, first published in 1965 and then printed in the 1974 collection, The Sleeping Lord and other fragments, space serves multiple, multiple functions, as it does in all book-like objects, but particularly medieval manuscripts and particularly modernist poetry. Um, it's the beat of the poem, it's visual, it's a call to converse from the margins and in the pauses. Um, white spaces invite the reader listener to embed themselves into the text, to slow down, to listen, to remember. I am absolutely fascinated by these two pages that I've put up. I was just saying to Geraint that this is one of my favourite of Jones's poetry. And I'm trying to work out what, because this is the absolute crux of everything for Jones from um, here and others of you to be detailed, not on other fatigues for the spectacle at the sixth hour in supplementary orders, not yet drafted to furnish for the speculators, those who handle the instruments, who are the instruments, to hang the gleaming trophy on the dreaming tree and to see on the leaning lignum, the spolia bloom where shine the five phalari that till the hard war and for his racked out limbs, extensus manibus, the dark bright armillae, qui est vir, qui habit coronum, mm. for the spined dark wreath, squalentem barban, without the circuit wall of his own patria. And all those footnotes taking us down to um, Griffith Grieg, qui your gur, qui I goron. It's Absolutely extraordinary, it's abs and it's reminiscent of Old English, of course, but all these other things. And can you read one column down and the second column down? Because I actually think you can. Um, anyway, I could spend the rest of the time on this, but I but I won't. But this space makes us stay with him and slow down. And it, of course, you have to read it out loud. We, we know that. So W. H. Auden also comments on the anamnesis that is the memory recall and simultaneous embedding of David Jones's depiction of Christian history. This embedding of all yesterdays, todays and tomorrows in the evocation of Western history within anathemata is a model for imagining the landscape of Western fringes and borderlands where East and West colonizer and colonized are realized in the naming of locations and the claiming of territory. Jones then tries to contain and make sense, he tells us of his own, and he calls it thing, his own thing. He says uh, in the introduction to Anathemata, so that to the question, what is this writing about? I answer that it is about one's own thing, which res, res, R -E -S, res is unavoidably part and parcel of the Christ, Western Christian res. He brings into a multilingual Anathemata all of history and creation framed by the Catholic mass at the poem's beginning and end. His effort to name and rename objects, places and figures through multiple eponyms actively resists cultural assimil assimilation, just as efforts elsewhere to retain a sense of communal and um, national indigenous identity, ultimately resist imperial or metropolitan domination. Jones's is a plea for the dignity and rightfulness of plurality in the past, present and future. Yet the poem is also about uh, confirming and explicating the inheritance of legacies of land, religion and people, the handing down of artistic and cultural accomplishment an effort to remember in a period of industrialization, technologization and war. And Jones, as Jones stood at the edge of a new era where he worked on this poem uh, during the critical period from 1938 to 1945. Your PowerPoint is unshared. Oh, well, that's annoying. Don't know why. Oh, perhaps I just lost signal. Hang on. Got it? Back? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um... He reflects on what we can learn from older transformations. Move, move through, move through. Okay. Out from Gens Romulum into the wheelkin, Dinas Mam gone Eithurad, Sives gone Waldman from Linden to London, bridges broken down. Sorry, I rushed that. In these lines, Jones takes on the Anglo Saxon settlement of Britain, though these bridges broken down are also the, the ruins of war, perhaps. He passes through the retreat of the Roman legions, the transformation of the Romanized populace 
to the position of foreigner upon the arrival of the Germanic tribes and diaspora of the Celts. 200 years of British turmoil in four tightly packed macaronic lines. The complex sound and structural play here is remarkable. Gens in the first line is half echoed by Gon in line three and four. Assonance unites wheel, dina, sives, three languages cohere orally through the year. The wheel is homographically ambiguous. Wheel as in weal, as in Welsh, or wheel as in common wheel. Alliteration links wheel, wallad and wold, or lindum, london, or bridges, broken, while chiastic structures like dinas, man, and wold, men, the singularity of the Briton versus the multitude of the invader. Cities are emptied, one civilization displaced by others, settlement, one group of people dislocated by invaders, land grab. On the impulse of the colonial and imperial, the anathemata pithily tells us it's a great robbery, is empire. These syntactically inverted lines highlight the theft made explicit by imperial ideology. Theft of a nation's language, of names and naming, people, places, urban and rural for Jones. His landscape throughout Anathemata is one that takes us to the Western fringes, the spaces that Lindy Brady has written about in writing the Welsh borderlands in Anglo-Saxon England, and Georgia Henley tackles in her forthcoming Oxford University Press publication, reimagining the past in the borderlands of medieval England and Wales, and that Professor Helen Fulton is currently directing a huge project over the next thousand years about, right? <laughs> so these Western fringes of England, Eastern for the Welsh, represent contested land, contested culture, and Jones keenly aware of the horrors of imperialism, colonization, violence of war, the serious impact it had. Lifelong on participants' mental health demonstrates throughout Anathemata the layeredness of cultural history. And his own hopeful anathematic fragments teach us a great deal about the patterns of history in the borderlands where East and West meet, patterns that reveal essentially an in-betweenness rather than demarcation. <clears throat> in, 1925, if, um, in 1925, he painted this uh, Sanctus Christus de Capilla uh, and this was on display at a guy in Brecon, Brecon, and it's much darker than it looks here, which I think is just important to note. Even the multilingual title of this piece situates Christ in the middle. A review of Jones's first exhibition in 1927 said his paintings were, and I quote, half maps and half pictures with a distance between near and far abolished. And this painting then depicts a new perspective on landscape, a perspective perhaps that's closely related to early medieval art, uh, where apparently there was no perspective, but of course that's not true. Where Christ, this perspective where Christ, but also the inhabitants of the Hondi Valley, Valley in Manidi of Eastern Wales stand or perhaps uh, stand on or perhaps create the semblance of an all seeing infinite depth. Jones incarnates Christ's passion between the hillside of Capel of Fiend, Chapel of the Boundary, where he lived with Eric Gill in Gill's Arts and Crafts Colony, um, which seems to me, and this would be an argument, to replicate a medieval Christian community of makers. And so Christ is between Capel of Fiend and the hillside where Offa's Dyke dissects the ridge, forming a boundary between England, Anglo-Saxon and modern, and Powys, medieval and modern, between Herefordshire to the west and Monmouthshire to the east. Christ in his passion bridges and intercalates a fractured vista, the two sides of the valley made to appear split by the earth's trembling at the climax of the crucifixion. As with many other elements in Anathemata and elsewhere in his work, allusion to the old English dream of the rood, which I hope you're familiar with. Yes, there's a nod, good. Um, resonates here with the freshly hewn wood of the still living cross, the branches of surviving trees reaching upward towards, uh, reaching towards a still upright and heroic Christ. The heron, local bird and symbol of suffering flies up as if referring to Christ, and in the Old English, Sipan Yabda is gassed on sended after he had sent forth his spirit. The Welsh pony on the opposite hill is somewhat ass-like, um, enacting a sort of visual reminder of Christ's triumphal entry to Jerusalem preceding his death and resurrection. And the water of life is background to Christ's upright body where a literal bridge unites the up lower and upper regions of the earth. Christ's wound bleeds in a flow that takes it into this water. And we're drawn down by the stakes, holding the cross firmly in the black mountainous depths into which Christ will descend. This wintry panorama, the leafless trees, the cloudy skies, 
The bleak hillsides remind us of the darkness at the moment, at the moment of Christ's spirit ascending forth. And all of that from, and that's not, you know, again, there's so much more one could say. How, how Jones strives to pack his watercolours or his inscriptions or his words with this sort of density of meaning, very medieval. Christ in between these hillsides creates a poetic space. Jones with his Welsh English identity is himself the coherent product of a disparate heritage, albeit a man he considered himself exiled from his patria as a Catholic pilgrim and exiled from a beloved Wales for much of his life. In the preface to his collection of essays and poems, Epoch and Artist, David Jones reveals his sense of being. It so happens, he says, that because of my father being wholly a Welshman from Gwynedd, East Conroy, I belong in part at least to the Welsh nation. My mother was English with some Italian blood. Further, it happens that certain of these papers deal with such aspects um, of the thing of Wales, things of Wales as I, an English monoglot and a Londoner, feel able to discuss. The feeling of being present at an unstable period, which he did feel at that point in um, world history, actually, an uncertain future disconnected from its past in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, affects kind, the kinds of temporal lacuna we see in much of his work. The continuities, though, so evident in Anathematus telling of history, migration, war, settlement, are at risk of rupture, fractured like the hillsides at Capel. The poem Anathemata seeks to continue connections to emphasize the linguistic and cultural tissues that bind, but Jones is always aware of the boundary and the spaces between. So this in-between space in Jones's work is paralleled by the um, specifically marked geography of Capital of Fien, uh, which I went to years ago and it was terrifying because the road is like as wide as a chair. Uh -huh. and I was trying to get a hire car down these walled hedges and at first I thought this was Capital of Fien, and, and well, it is, right? It's the chapel, but it's not obviously where they all packed in, um, which is this, obviously, the community that Gill founded for those years in the 20s. Um, and it's it's just outside Hay, um, between Hay and Lantony. Um, it's bounded, the whole valley by Office Dyke, encombed in the Hondi Valley. So that's the view, and it's Office Dyke on the top there. Um, and indeed, David Jones often visited a Skyfjord near Holywell um, with, his with his father. It's the place of his um, Welsh grandparents' birth. So just here at the bottom, right at the bottom of this picture. The dyke's closeness to Skyfjord, together with notable other prehistoric monuments in the landscape, meant that Jones began associating his grandfather with the boundary land, associating locus with family, place with person. The land stands metonymically for all those ever upon and within it, the container of souls, if you will. So changing and multivalent, the strated landscape is what names um, and topography, fragments of the past reveal for Jones. These transformations were often the result of colonization, impositions of the more powerful. Jones, as I've said, was keenly aware of the horror of empire and the claims of some over others, often first comers. And he reveals the complexity of sim simultaneous layering through the making of language. He can be identified as a shaper, what the early English called the show, S-C-O-P, the poet. Making, he says, follows being. This being is spoken out in his polyphonic response to a Christ, and I quote, that the world cannot hold, um, a singular phenomenon that provides hopefulness to Jones despite the horrors of the world. Alpha es et o, that which the world cannot hold, Aveling to the heaven king, shepherd of Greek land, Harrower of Anun, freer of the waters, physician and dux et pontifex, guledig nevoi and walder of every land, et vocabitor wonderful. Because of his own sense of wonder, Jones leaves a st stability, a foundation in Old English of fastnung, in his framing topos of the Christian mass, mass in Anathemata. Yet perhaps there is more in his telling, that empires must fall and oppression must cease, that all voices can be discovered and must be heard, and significantly, usually silenced voices can be invented in the landscape, and particularly on the fringes, the peripheries. In the, in the edges of colonial enterprise is yet where myth and history converge, and where peoples can find hope of survival. 
He tells us, the maker's van a thing to can at a pinch beat out, utile spares for the mobile columns or amulets for the raiding captains, and the captains themselves being certain specifications and new god fears, the adaptations, the fusions, the transmogrifications, but always the inward continuities of the site of place. In this critical set of verses, the clear distinction between utile and gratuitous, that is between outer transformation, adaptations, fusions, the transmogrifications, and inner continuity become paramount. Actually, this is this is it. I think this is it. Um, that continuity is to be found in sight and place. And it's here that I find the Welsh English David Jones to be most explicit in what he's, what he's doing with the medieval, the classical, the prehistoric and the present. That is, he understands the simultaneity of change and constancy. His use of the medieval is as acknowledging its still presentness. It is not a static past and neither is his era and desire to remember a neo-medieval or a reconfigured medieval. We need to be careful of saying that these modernists, and actually it's from Morris, well, it's pre-Morris, isn't it? But all, all the way through the late 19th and into the 20th centuries, it's not a neo-medieval. It's not a kind of recreational, recreational, representational thing, I don't, I don't think. It's a sort of transubstantive, right? As we might expect with Jones. It's a persistently present presence, persistently present presence, best represented or represented in sight, in place, in the hill rhythms, the landscape, and especially perhaps Slight shift here, stone. Um, he says in, uh, I think it's in Fatigue, he talks about the centurions in Fatigue as stones in the living wall, sort of living stones in the living wall. So his most famous poetic works, uh, in parenthesis, Anathemata, are themselves stones, building blocks of experience. The one is an aside, it's bracketed in parenthesis. The other is a fragment, is fragments of an attempted writing of devoted things, that is anathemata, devoted things. Anne Price Owen, in her discussion of David Jones and the art of hybridity, sees in anathemata, and I quote, a double entendre, hybridity even, a gathering in of everything. But I see only wholeness, I do not see hybridity, I see only wholeness, a medieval understanding of creation and one's place in it. And this is all, this all encompassing is best exemplified for me easily by the grotesques adjacent um, to a saint on a cathedral's west front, or to the curious figures enlivening the devotional worlds and images of a book of hours. In other words, it's all, it's all there, right? It's all there. Sacred, profane, celestial, mundane, it's all there. And, and that, that's what I think is going on. For David Jones in all his major works, um, I believe wholeness is made manifest through seamless combination of word and image. Jones's emphasis on logos is widely commented upon, but it's the endeavor of the whole that's essential. His work, I st strongly believe, I don't think this is like a surprise, it's devotional, right? It's devotional. Um, like a medieval religious craft persons, um, as I'll go on to explain, the entirety of in parenthesis or anathemata is the key. And while these works can never be effectively complete, so I don't, when I say whole, I don't mean complete, they can be whole. So they're not complete, they, but they can be whole a unity, a raise, a thing, word and image or verbal poem and accompanying transcription, inscription, accompanying inscription, one thing. I took this photo at the National Library, gosh, 10 or more years ago. And there's Jones kind of in the background, it's like, ooh, ooh. Both Anne Price Owen and Francesca Brooks focus their attention on David Jones's inscriptions as they appear in his epic poems. They and other scholars recognize the integral nature of image and word, reading from the inscription with its notable letter forms, emulating earlier systems of script across the page to the accompanying poetry. So when they look at his inscriptions, they look across the page to the accompanying words in the books, drawing out significances that enhance our overall interpretation of Jones's complex expression. For Anne Price Owen, the famous red and black inscription included as page 241 of Anathemata, that's this one, and I quote, does not deliberately imitate an historical document, but is more concerned with evoking the feeling of the ethos of the original text. 
Now, I admit to not quite understanding what this means. I don't see Jones as imitating, but neither do I believe that the inscription seeks to evoke a feeling or an ethos of the original, which is this. Jones is influenced artistically by medieval script, and we know that he worked on this at Camberwell School, and we know that he had books of medieval plates, uh, manuscript plates. Um, but he see, and he seems definitely, so this is the close-up, right? So on the bottom here, on Gurda Henetha, Ye on Helef, Fat Was God, on Niftig, Strang, and Stiff Mode, Yestache on Ye Algan Heena, Modig on Manigre, Yesitha, from the Dream of the Root, when Christ descends across. That's the quotation on Jones's um, inscription. And then on the top here um, is just, um, actually, so here's uh, Aexla Yespana. So this is the axile tree. But um, Jones copies actual letter forms. So the round-limbed Y of Drift there that you can see is there in Lusan to release. Begotten, you see that T form, look at that T form, it's quite unusual, is here in Strang. And Yesheat, you look at the punctuation in Yesheat, that's a positura. Well, he makes up his own punctuation in his inscriptions, but it's interesting that he has one, two, and three red points in that particular inscription. And I think for the Chelly book, plates that he saw will have influenced directly that work. But it's not imitative. It's not imitative. It's not an adaptation of insular script, as Fran Brooks suggests, nor indeed is it neo-primitive letter forms, naive, as Ewan Clayton has described them. In the one description, Jones provides examples blended in their lateral contiguity, um, and we can just go back to the inscription, uh, blended in their lateral contiguity. We've got square and rustic Roman capitals. We've got uncials, insular minuscule, and for good measure, I think the curly E is based on either, it's not Greek, it's either Beneventan script or influenced by the high E of English vernacular minuscule. So that's a quick uh, paragraphical paragraph there for you. Special graphs, part of the Germanic alphabet, F, F, Ash, F, and Thor in the present. And they're all capitals, not lowercase. Some people see lowercase graphs there. There's no lowercase there. It's all majuscule. So other inscriptions like Arbor Decora are akin to the multi-oriented inscriptions of many, many um, medieval monuments. So one thinks, so this, very, very famous, um, and the bit of Old English is the same bit of Old English, right? It goes round the outside. You can see on the left, <laughs> vertical on Gurda Hina, at the top, Fayeyong Helef, Fat, and then down the right, Waz Gord is Gord al -Mithdig. But there's also Greek and obviously Latin here. <laughs> Jones called the Old English a jolly nice bit. It's a jolly nice bit of English, that's good. Um, but of course, it's reminiscent of the of the inscription of something like the Pillar of Elisig um, up in uh, local to like this near Llangollen, which has a circular inscription. What you can see is a more modern inscription right there, but the inscription on the left is the medieval, very early medieval inscription. And it doesn't, it's not a, um, it's not a range like you see on the left-hand side there. It's much more kind of something like the Ruggle Cross, which is that extraordinary monument that he knew for sure. I don't know if he saw it, but he definitely knew it. Where there's this framing of image or well, sculpture and uh, runic, but also Latin inscription that I think, again, kind of really influences his idea of wholeness. So he seems to be engaged in practices that are themselves those of the medieval craftsperson scribe and religious author. And what some have seen as imitation or naivety is, to my mind, unequivocally veneration in the form of an emulative practice that makes reference directly or indirectly to auctoritas and to precedent. And such practices can actually be seen in ma multiple major manuscripts in the Middle Ages, the same sense of emulation as veneration one thinks of Cotton Vitellius A15, better known as the Beowulf manuscript, but actually part one of that, which is 12th century, or the West Saxon Gospels, the one here, Hatton 38, in the Bodleian, the A. Adwina and Anglo Catalan Psalters, very famous. Um, and Welsh manuscripts like Cambridge, Corpus Christi College, manuscript 199, which is Yayen Lapsilian's De Trinitate. Um, all of this sort of e emulation as veneration is going on there. So it's difficult really to put into um, intelligible words the consequences of Jones's schemes, such as it was, and its potential. 
sort of it's all sort of in itself ineffable so within the form of jones's books in their wholeness the whole book it's the blended blending of sacred and profane as i've suggested spiritual and mundane um that creates this wholeness exactly as is the case with the medieval religious codex manufactured for devotional and contemplative impulses so i see the white space in jones as contemplation um i actually annotate some of my books um and it invites that too right in discussing the theology to which he was indebted, Jones specifically praises its um, unific wholeness of form. And in, mere, in materials being prepared for an exhibition in um, the archive at the National Library, the Eric Gill, well, it's the Jones Eric Gill archive, Eric Gill commented of Jones's belief that, and I quote yes. Mrs. Gill quoting Jones, a wood engraving being normally a thing in a book owes something in the way physical labour, finish and tightness to the book of which it is a part. So so when we when we use when we use books like when we use Jones's editions and we extract, you know, we either extract the what we talk about the poem or we extract the inscriptions and we create separate things of them. That's um, a disservice. So in uh, his creative process, then these books become edifices of faith and salvation history. And this creative intentionality reminds me of the great glossed books of the pre-modern period, like this thirteenth century. Looks chaotic, but it isn't commentary with glosses he's common of course he provides glosses and um commentary on his own work so rather like this book which is absolutely monumental jones's works in parenthesis and anathemata sleeping lord and other fragments are monumental made concrete by the form of the works themselves which encompass a multitude of potential devotional and scholastic functions so the artist's portrait with which i started the presentation becomes a monument uh, this is Jones doing drawing himself on the left. Look at a Yadwinner on the right. I mean, anyway, the artist's portrait then is a monument. It's a testimony to the work of the artisan through time and space, resilient, situated, present, but adaptable and respectful to past tradition. Monumentality, like Jones's inscriptions, highlights the importance of stone and of surface um, to this poet. Stone and surface, both as substrate for word and image, but also as a testimony to history's longevity, resilience, and contemporary significance. Stone is the landmark of the past. So similar claims can be made in the work of other Welsh poets um, writing in Welsh and in English, and the Western medieval sense of situatedness um, being one in a sequence of authors and craftspeople, a sequence that provides an anchor and a sense of identity is seen in the work of R.S. Thomas, I'm thinking especially of poems like Perspectives, of Waldo Williams's great works, T.H. Parry Williams, here and there, and persistently Ruth Bidgood. Um, in terms of scale, none of these poets' individual works seeks to parallel Jones's great epic effort, but in their emphasis on the long history of Wales and its ability to transform while remaining intrinsically rooted, whole and identifiable, there are commonalities to be drawn out, um, which makes me sure I, or think that these poets, all of these poets I've just mentioned, are actually devotional in, in impulse. So Ruth Bidgood died only recently in 2022, um, just a few months before her 100th birthday, and she was educated here in Oxford at St. Hugh's, where she read English and would have done Old and Middle English and so on. And from the 1960s, she lived in Aberguessin in Paris. Um, she published many collections, um, all I think in English. Uh, this is her new and selected poems available in your local black rolls. Um, so numerous poems, ones that I, 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 as I got this, I was like, oh, what's he, what's he here? You know, there's a poem called Strata Florida. Um, there's a poem called At Nevern, right? So immediately you can get a sense of kind of what she's doing. There's a poem called Arthur. There's a poem called Lina Van Vach. And these testify just by their titles really to her sense of history, rootedness and the permanence of the landscape. She is an extraordinary landscape poet. She's extraordinary. She's absolutely extraordinary. So several poems, several poems in particular, raise the potential to be read as more modest, or well, just different, right? Um, in the in the kind of theme or way of sort of Jones's impulse, drawing in history, the medieval, writing for perpetuity, memory and commemoration. And in her new work presented in this uh, new and selected poems, uh, inscriptions. So it's a new poem, Inscriptions, the third part of which is called Stones. Um, and it presents us with a contemplation of early medieval post-Roman graveyard monuments. And 
Here is one of these, raised to remember Paulinus. Of course, I went off down a rabbit hole to find the stone. I'll show it to you in a minute. Um, he was a teacher of St. David who lived around 500 CE. And this stone that she's referring to here was found at Pontepollion, Cayo, near Tally in Carmarthenshire. And it's now at Carmarthen Museum. It's, it's damaged. Um, we look back, we treasure. This was a man of gravitas, true inheritor. We must remember, we must copy, we must transmit. Shadows, a background to rational light. We do not recognize the dark beyond these bounds. All shall be fittingly done. Thus we remember the noble Paulinus, the guardian of the faith, always a lover of his homeland. Here Paulinus lies, most conscientious observer of all that is right. So this is, I found this in a 19th century antiquarian book yesterday. Got this inscription at the top, you can see, which is the inscription she translates. Servato fidei patrique semper amator, hic Paulinus jacet cultur pientissimus acri. Keeper of the faith, constant lover of his country, and so on. So this appears in translation at the end of the contemplation of its own significance. And what's really interesting here, well, lots of interesting things, but we is the voice of a united claim to this person, Paulinus, and their legacy. We are asked to treasure the past and to have that same gravitas that would make of us all true inheritors. But Paulinus's example of mor moral conscious reminds us that we must transmit and emulate. But the we is also the prosopopeic stone, speaking out as the rude speaks out in the Old English, the dream of the rude. The voice of the stone is double then, it self-authorizes its own function as a marker of the past, present and future. For bid good, stone has the ability to move, to make us recall, to affect our perspective and perception. In the 1972 collection, The Given Time, the poem Stone brings back to life the ruins of a long lost place. Waves of life receding left jetsam of stone grey megaliths, half sunk in tussocky grass now. A roofless hut of later years perched high upstream under the shadow of cairned hills. Stone proclaims life, affirms a future by virtue of so many pasts. And that's an image from, um, I think it might, it's, it's Snowdonia. I got lost in Snowdonia in 2019. I really did get badly lost, actually. And um, anyway, this was nice. I took a photo. Of, well, it's not nice, is it? It's very sad, but it's also evocative. Um, for Bidgood, far from being inanimate or simply a witness to a past and ruined way of life, stone proclaims life and affirms the future precisely because of its permanence. It's NRJ providing vibrancy and hope. And my favourite of all is the standing stone, which once again, as you can see, transmits energy, life, and its own history into the present and beyond. And the picture is of the fish stone, which is in um, some landed gentry estate near Llanurtid Well. But here in this poem, uh, this poem, the phenomenological experience of the singularity of time and the persistence of the past is brought to the fore. Such a phenomenological poetic response seems present in much of Bidgood's work, as in Jones's, as in other poets I'm focused on. Um, in contradistinction, I feel, to the corpora of poets like Dylan Thomas or um, Gillian Clark or a number of others. This phenomenological is an embodied consciousness of the world and all the things in it, and it lends itself to being called devotional. It's absolutely apparent in Bidgood's Standing Stone, where she says in stanza two, I pressed my palms against the almost smoothness of the stone, the stone stores it transmits. I cannot ask, having no word of power, no question formed. My hands offer a dumb love, a hope towards the day of the freed valley. Flesh fits itself to the slow curve of dominating stone. It's wonderful. The persistent present of the past, uh, here surely prehistoric rather than medieval, infuses Bidgood's work. The knowledge and love of Welsh legend and the autoritas of preceding writers inspires her poem Savadan from the printed miracle, which retells the legend of Llyn Savadan, uh, Llangor Splate, told by <laughs> Gerard Cumro in The Journey Through Wales, the description of Wales. A Cranog sits in the lake, which is uh, also said to be where the Roman town of Leventium or Brekenenmere was submerged. Gerard tells us that he visited the lake and saw an abundance of fish in peculiar hues um, in the water. And as Bidgood glosses in her preface to the poem, Geraldus says that three knights once put this tradition to the test. The two Anglo-Normans got no response to their commands, but for Griffith, Aparis, Tudor, every bird cried aloud. It's a great poem, her Sadavan. So Gerald of Wales, I'm coming to a close in a minute. So Gerald of Wales inspired so many others too, and perhaps none more important than T.H. Parry Williams, who won the chair and the crown twice 
in 1215, uh, 1215, no, he's not that medieval. <laughs> 1912 and 1915, he won the crown and the chair at both Eisteddfodau. And he won the chair at the Wrexham Eisteddfod with his Prithist Gerard Cymro in 1912. Now, I don't think this has ever been translated. I've tried to translate it. I'm not going to show you the translation, not in this company, but um, I'm working on it. It's a four-part, 20-page poem, a biographical work of Gerald of Wales, Gerard Cymro, told in the third person about his long life, his struggles, his love of his country, the hills, the landscape. It's set in Paris, St. David's, Kairlutkoid, which, which I think is meant to be Litchfield. Litchfield. Yeah, okay, good. Although he was, wasn't Gerald at Lincoln, not Litchfield. That's when he died. Yeah, he so... From Litchfield, I think he from being connected. Yeah, so <laughs> it's a curious thing. <laughs> Kairlutkoid, um, and Manabir, so four those four places. It takes us back and forth in history. Gerard's own, but also that of Wales. So Gerard, Gerard kind of represents the whole country. It's impossible not to feel Parry Williams's own deep sense of longing and belonging as he writes this prithist. And parts of this work seem to preempt the later Hon, one of his most, which I can't read for weeping, um, not sentimentally, but because it's so, it's so moving. One of his most famous striking and moving poems. So this is just one stanza from Gerard Cymro. That last uh, pair of verse lines, Gerard rung nevoi the dyer atlatai, I Gumri and Gumri Reeve just really reminds me of on Dwella from Clawane, my Clysia Adricholiae Fair Feed of Flair. Just kind of, I, you know, and these are apart by decades, aren't they? So, obviously, much more one could say about that. Um, but seeing Gerald's life laid out, the reminiscences, the alertness to the struggles of Wales, the simplicity of childhood, the desire for death, brings me very quickly to my final Welsh poet who's longing for her native land emerges in the poems she wrote when she was very old and far away, living as an expatriate in Waxaca, Mexico. This is Beatrice Spooner Jones Levitoff, mother of the poet Denise Levitoff, very famous American adopted poet. Beatrice was born and lived near Merthyr Tydfil before moving to Holywell, where she was brought up. She wrote a large collection of poems, barely if any of which have been published, I believe, and her extensive archive of poetry, letters, drawings and diaries is in Stanford University Library, where her daughter was a professor in my department. Denise Levitoff's biographer, Dana Green, tells us that Beatrice Levitoff was, and I quote, enamoured of Sir Walter Scott, a deep appreciation of history, of archaeological ruins, of churches, roads, and burial grounds. She unlocked the natural and created beauty of the English countryside where they lived for part of their lives, for Olga um, Levitoff and Denise, her daughters. According to Denise Levitoff, if Paul Levitoff, the very famous Anglican Jewish um, philosophical theologian, if he gave his daughters gifts of eloquence and fervour, Beatrice gave them Welsh intensity and a lyric feeling for nature. In a moving poem full of a sense of shifting perspectives entitled Aberconide on the River Taff, 1892 to 94, written in the closing years of Levitoff's life in 1974 in a Waxaca, she continues her remembrances with the re-envisioning of what it was to be seven and with her friends making toys from the mud and the sorrel and the stones. The coal mines, the hillsides, the river, the wind and the sheep make for a detailed and idyllic scene that casts her back to an unchanging sea rooted in an, uh, uh, and embodied by, rooted in and embodied by a longing for the landscape. While hardly medieval, its sense of the past is as a permanence, safe, Happy, she tells us, always summer. For her, the stones you can see there. Halfway down the first page, Tilly has arranged stones to outline a house. She takes a smooth stone and wraps it in her pinafore. It is her baby. So the stones for Levitoff outline a house and a child's pretend doll, family and security. As David Jones's centurions in fatigue become a living wall, as Bidgood's stone stores, transmits, and waits, so the fabric of Wales is past, remains present in the now and always. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>